Thank you, Brother Jimmy, and you all for singing along. How many of y'all enjoyed your holiday weekend? Boy, y'all sound too excited. Some hands went up though, so I think you enjoyed it. Amen. Praise God for you all being here today. And we'll see what the Lord has for us in His Word today. So, uh, we have set aside in our nation this special time for us to uh, celebrate our independence from British rule and others that want to rule us and tell us what we have to believe and what we have to study and who we have to obey. Uh, we've celebrated uh, July the 4th this weekend all kinds of different ways. There are folks that have had big cookouts. Uh, Alice and I were blessed to be able to go up to the campground uh, where my best friend Steve Reed and his wife Vanessa, they have a ministry there and they preach every Sunday morning. And uh, Thomas and Shannon go up there and help them some, and they were there, and uh, they forced your pastor to eat some homemade ice cream, and he enjoyed it, and so did his wife, amen. It only took me three helpings of homemade ice cream to figure out I liked it. So <laughs> praise God for that. And uh, some people celebrate by fireworks, so we sat outside last night, my wife and I and, and uh, Jean and Marilyn, and watched our neighbor. Uh, shoot off uh, a lot of money up into the sky. Amen. And then uh, if you did not know this, but Joey Chestnut set a record in 10 minutes yesterday. He ate 75 hot dogs. Amen. Can any of you all compete with that? Amen. No, you can't. I hope you don't try. Amen. Uh, but there's just a lot of ways that we celebrate what uh, God has allowed us to experience as a nation. And so we're going to talk about today and try to preach about revolution today. The word revolution, the definition of that is this. It's a dramatic, wide-reaching change in the way that something works or is organized or changing the way people have their ideas and think about something. Let us pray. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are today. And God, more than anything, we pray that God, you save someone's soul today that's listening or watching through Facebook, uh, God, or that's here in person. God, there may be somebody here that does not know you. They've heard all about you. They sing the songs. They come to church. They uh, got to have all kind of works that they do. But you say we can't be saved by works. We're saved by grace. So, God, I pray for that person today. That, God, this be the day that they accept you as Lord and Savior. Bind Satan away. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all. Amen and amen today. Uh, so... <clears throat> For us to obey what the government tells us to do is one thing, but if the government tells me, tells me and tells you who you have to worship and who you have to fall down to, that's a whole other matter. And that's what was going on before the revolution uh, in 1776. And so we want to look at a couple of things that go all the way back to the Old Testament. So get in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And then soon thereafter, we will move to Daniel chapter 6. In the book of Daniel chapter 3, you are familiar with the story, I'm sure, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were given instruction in the first part of that chapter of Daniel. In chapter 3, it said, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits. He set up it in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So he had created an image of gold and it was 90 foot tall by 9 foot wide. And so he evidently had a lot of pride. Amen. But verse 2 said, Then Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king, sent to gather together all the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And so he gives instruction in verse 5. I'm trying to save you time here. He said that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sacrament of the psaltery or the dulcimer, all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image 
that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falls not down and worships the shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fire furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you know the story, they did not obey what they were told to do because they worshiped God only. Amen. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, he said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I've set up? He said, Now if you be ready, what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down to worship the image which I've made. Well, but if you worship not, you'll be cast the same iron to the midst of a burning fire furnace. And who is that God shall deliver you out of my hands? And here's their response in verse 17. If that be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And He'll deliver us out of your king, out of your hand, king. But if not, I love verse 18. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image set up. You see what happened all the way after they were cast into the midst of the burning fire. They had some men that they placed in there. The fire even burnt those men that placed them into that burning fire. But here was, here's what happened. King said, I, I saw four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says this, and the fourth, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You see, Jesus Christ has always been here, but not always in the flesh. Amen? Said the fire had no power on them. It didn't burn them. They didn't even have the smell of smoke upon themselves. Now look at Daniel chapter 6. Daniel himself was a man of prayer. He had been ordered to pray to the king. Been ordered to pray to the king. And if he didn't, he'd be cast into a den of lions. So when Daniel found out about that in verse 10, it says, And the writing was signed, he went to his house and his windows, being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day, which proved to me he was already a man of prayer. And he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They came near and spoke before the king concerning the king's decree. He said, Have you not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any God or man within thirty days, save of these? In other words, you're not to pray to anybody except the king. O king, will he be cast into the land of den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of Medes and the Persians, which alters not. In other words, the law doesn't change. And then they spoke to him about Daniel. Daniel was cast in verse 16. The king commanded and they brought Daniel, cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said to Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. A stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. The king signed it, sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his Lord, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, passed the night fasting, neither were instruments of music brought before him. His sleep went from him. Well, all the way down to verse 22. Here's what Daniel said. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, but they've not hurt me. For as much before him innocency was found in me, and also before the old king, I've done no hurt. I read that because as believers in Jesus Christ, there is a hall of fame that goes all the way back to the Old Testament that we are instructed by God that yes, we are to obey our local laws as best we know how, but we are not instructed to worship anybody except our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. and His Father and the Trinity that God has set up. We are not instructed to do anything different than that. And if we, if we are, it is wrong. And that's what began part of the revelation, revolution rather of our nation. Now let me read some things to you that happened. And so the first part here that says that biblical reformation and teachings attempted to suppress the spread of those teachings when the, the English were forcing Americans to not worship 
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They tortured the people. They brought bloody purges, barbaric persecutions, such as when the French leaders conducted this famous St. Bar Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and they killed over 110,000 people trying to force them to obey the king's laws. And in fact, in James chapter 1, I'm reading from the history of this, it said, in addition to brutal persecutions and murders to help combat the theological teaching and writings leveled against him, the king even ordered church leaders to recall that James 1 was the head of the church and you and he stands in the place of God. So he represents the people. Complete submission and non-resistance and authority that because kings have an allegedly divine position, they are not forever to be resisted for any reason. Not surprisingly, Reformation followers openly opposed James. And he leveled even harsher penalties against them through mutilation, hanging, and disemboweling. Now where in the world would somebody like King James or any nation come up with an idea to raise himself above God? If you were to look in Isaiah chapter 14, you can look where that himself, one of God's precious angels, raised himself above God or was trying to, trying to do that. And he spoke in Isaiah 14, 13. He said... I will exact my throne above, get that word above, the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In other words, he said, I'll be equal to God. Of course, you know the story. God said, no, I'm going to cast you down to the pit. Amen. And in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8, after Jesus Christ had fasted for 40 days and nights, Satan came to tempt him. And by the way, take a note in that. Take a note in that any time that you dedicate yourself to God for any reason, get ready, you're going to be attacked. Amen? Always be ready for that. And so Matthew 4, 8, it said, The devil took Jesus to an exceedingly high mountain and showed Him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And here's what He said to him. The devil said, All these things I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship Me. He fall down and worship Me. And so here's the response that Jesus said. You get hence, in other words, be gone. Be gone away from me. You'll worship the Lord your God and only Him shall you serve. And then it says in Matthew 4.11 that the angels immediately came and ministered to Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we're celebrating this weekend not only our nation, but being out from under a rule that tells us that we have to worship the gods that Satan is twisting their arm, getting them to do what he wants those kings and those in authority to do. And so there's a whole lot to talk about in today's message, and I pray that I do the job that God wants done. And here's a side note here to this message. It said that but the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Congregationalists, and almost all other denominations of that day adopted the theological viewpoint presented by Luther that said this. Americans embraced two specific theological positions that guided their thinking and conduct in this conflict with Great Britain. Christian denominations held that while they were forbidden to overthrow the institution of government, they were not required to blindly submit to every law and policy that overthrows God. God has ordained government in lieu of anarchy. He opposed anarchy, rebellion, lawlessness, and wickedness. It says the scripture model for this position was repeated and validated when God Himself raised up leaders like Gideon, Ehud, Jephthah, Samson, and Deborah to throw off tyrannical governments. Leaders subsequently praised in Hebrews 11.32. Founding Father James Otis explained the only king who has a divine right is God Himself. Has government any solid foundation? I think it has an everlasting foundation and an unchangeable will of God. There can be no prescription old enough to supersede the law of nature and the grant of God Almighty who has given to all men a natural right to be free. God is the only monarch in this universe who has a clear and indisputable right to absolute power because He is the only one who is omniscient as well as omnipotent. 
Kings or parliaments could not give the rights essential to happiness. We claim them from a higher source. The King of kings and Lord of lords. These cannot be taken away from us by any human power without taking our lives. You and I stand here today as free as we are because multiplied thousands gave their life for us to be free. Not only back in the 1700s and even before then, but still going on today, there are those men and women that are still fighting for us to be free. We ought to be praising God for them, thanking God for them. He he continues on to this message uh, right here. Even from Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution, sign of the Declaration of Independence. He recommended that a study of the Scriptures come in order to understand the basis of America's struggle against a tyrannical king. Nehemiah chapter 4. Look there in your Bibles if you have your Bibles. You say, Brother Mike, I don't know where Nehemiah's at. Go to Psalms and keep turning left. Amen? Keep turning left. But Nehemiah chapter 4, they were coming under attack from the enemy, just like our nation is right now. We're going to address some of that in just a minute. But Nehemiah chapter 4, as they begin to attack, here's what God did. And here's what we need to do. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher... That's verse 13 of Nehemiah 4. On the higher place, I even set people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. By the way, in case you didn't know today, if you're looking at via Facebook, this is your sword. Amen. This is your sword. You can do a lot more with this than you can do with any other weapon that's ever been formed. He said, I looked and I rose up and I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. Great if He's on your side. Terrible if you're the enemy of God. Amen. And what does it say there? He said, Fight for your brethren. Include your whole family here. Your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. You don't know it maybe, and maybe I don't know much about it myself. But right now in the United States of America, we are in the midst of a fight. We are in a fight, and I'm going to be able to show you in just a few minutes. I'll tell you what is at stake. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ today is at stake. And that's why pastor after pastor, person that I talk to, people I talk to all the time involved in ministries all over, the gospel is what's at stake, and the gospel is what's being pushed aside in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only thing that can change nations and change people one person at a time. Back to some history. The rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which is to be found in the New Testament, by the way, which is God Himself and Jesus Christ. Reverend Jacob Dusha, a supporter even of the British, the enemy, argued from the Bible in favor of the American position, explaining this. Whenever we as rulers abuse their sacred trust by unrighteous attempts to injure and oppress and enslave those very people from whom alone under God their power is derived. Does not humanity, does not reason, does not Scripture call upon the man, the citizen, the Christian of such a community and stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. The apostle enjoins us to submit to every ordinance for the Lord's sake. Make sure you throw that phrase in there. But surely a submission to the unrighteous ordinances of unrighteous men cannot be for the Lord's sake. For He loved the righteous, and His countenance behold the things that are just. Galatians 5 1 says this, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We have been in bondage and been attacked since the beginning of the world and we're getting a warning there from God to not be involved in the thing that entangle us which by the way is always sin the burning of the town in 1774 was one of the key things that awoke our nation to British rule it's said that they 
set aside churches to make sure that the temples or the, the steeple on top of the church burned. And here's what they call them. That they made them into the church. They made the church into great pyramids of fire. And in the Boston Massacre of 1770 where that they killed people. We as Americans believe that we had a biblical right to defend ourselves. And we still do today. Amen. We still do today. So all these things talk about war and talk about all kinds of subjects and all kinds of situations, but listen at this. The Americans believing that they were thus operating under fundamental, fundamental but biblical principles. Founding Father Samuel Adams warned the British officials, there is one above us who, who will take exemplary vengeance for every insult upon His Majesty. You know that the cause of America is just. You know that she contends for that freedom in which all men are entitled. She contends against oppression, raffin, and more than savage barbarity. The blood of the innocent is upon your hands, and all the waters of the ocean will not wash them clean. We make again our solemn appeal to God in heaven to decide between you and us. We pray that in the, the, the scale of battle we may be successful as we have justice on our side. Now this part right here proves that he was a believer. And he said this, and that the merciful Savior of the world may forgive our oppressors. Why would I read all these things today? I thought about it and chewed about it and prayed about it. What if they had turned on each other? Think about that. The days you, days you sit here in, in this congregation or you're watching via Facebook. What if they turned on each other? What do you mean, Brother Mike? It means that just like today in the United States of America, we have a common enemy by the name of Satan. And He has us fighting with each other. As long as we continue to fight each other, the Gospel of Jesus Christ gets squashed out. And that's what we're doing. And we're embracing that fight. Can I ask you from the bottom of my heart as a pastor of Jesus Christ, has God called you to do that? Or has He called you to fight for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Amen. Don't get those two confused. Let's see what the Word of God says. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. You know, they would have never had success back then if they turned on each other. We would have never been a nation founded on godly principles if they turned on each other. If we are to continue to be a nation founded on godly principles, and trying to allow our best to live by godly principles, we must not continue to fight amongst ourselves. Ephesians 6.12 You think somebody else is your enemy? They're not. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you, not part of it, but take the whole armor of God, you may be able to withstand an evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, have your loins girt about with the truth. This is the truth. Amen. This is the truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, he, I, I, God's saying, I've got something for you to do. It's to share the gospel of peace. You won't do that as long as you're fighting amongst each other instead of after our enemy. Above all, verse 16, taking the shield of faith where you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. A, a shield of faith is a defensive weapon. And take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Your Bible is your offensive weapon. Amen. We defeat the enemy by using the Word of God. 
Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And look what is still at stake today. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the Gospel. What's at stake in our nation today is the same thing that's always been at stake. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Satan wanted Jesus Christ destroyed from the time that He was placed on His earth until He left this world. And He failed because Jesus Christ rose again. We have hope in it. All our promises are in the, the fact that there was a resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we will be raised again. But listen to another note from history before I continue on. The spiritual nature of America's resistance was so clear even to the British that the British Parliament said this. If you ask an American who is his master... He'll tell you he has none nor any governor but Jesus Christ. Amen. When's the last time you and I took a stand that strong? And listened to all the rhetoric, rhetoric and all the things that are going on and we made sure that that person standing in front of us heard that what's at stake in America is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because here's what they want to do. They want to tie you up in all of the arguments and all other fights. But what's at stake during this time in our nation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're being deceived. Revelation 12, 9 talks about this. It says that old serpent, the devil, he's called the devil, and Satan did what? It said he deceived the whole world. As long as Satan has you and has me deceived against fighting against others about who they are and what they are, then the gospel gets squashed. I heard a black preacher this morning say this. If ignorant black people think that the destruction of someone's property is what God wants them to do, then they are horribly wrong. Amen. And he said also, if ignorant white people still hang on to their prejudice and they also ride against the blacks that are both made in God's image, then they are wrong. You may not want to hear this this morning, but I, God has shared this with me today when I woke up. Amen. Somebody asked me last night, just making a joke about me, uh, about the fact that I, I'm kind of dark-skinned. I've always been dark-complected. And she asked me, just teasing me, she said, Brother Mike, what have they called you? I said, I can't tell you everything people have called me. Amen. <laughs> but when I got up this morning I thought from the whitest of the white to the blackest of the black do you reckon that it's any accident you all that Jesus fits right in the middle when he died on a cruel Roman cross for us he died for the whitest of the white and the blackest of the black Amen. isn't it amazing that he's not Either one of those far extremes. He's somewhere right in the middle. If we'll place Jesus in the middle of our arguments and see that the black folk, as dark as they can be, or the whitest of the white, have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God will be honored. We do Him no honor by destroying anything. No honor. God help us as a nation as we do those things. God help us. God help us. God's got a word for us. Here's our answer. Second Chronicles 7.14 He said, My people, which are called by My name, shall humble themselves. Humble means that you're not standing up high in pride. And pray. And seek My face. Look at the order of those things and turn from their wicked ways. See, we like to do some of those, but we don't want to do them all. Then will I hear from heaven. And what does He say before that He'll heal our nation? He said, I will forgive their sins. Then our nation gets healed. 
So I still, I proclaim to you today that our nation, every man, boy, woman, and little girl, no matter where they're from, they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Don't let us as a church body to join in every argument that Satan would put out there and get caught up in that. We ought to be sending out the Scriptures about being saved. More than any message that Benzor Baptist can send out to change this world, change this community, change your home is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So what have we done what have we done about any of this? Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and I close. Hebrews chapter 12. So before I read it, let me ask in the congregation out here today, and to those of you at home, when's the last time that you lost some blood about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Working as a carpenter, as a missionary, hitting your thumb with a hammer does not count. Amen? Slamming your finger in the door of a church van when you're trying to pick up kids does not count. Amen? Stubbing your toe barefooted and blood being shed does not count. When's the last time we did anything? For God that caused us to lose blood intentionally. Hebrews 12, 1. So wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that so easily besets us. Do you all know that right now Satan has us carrying a weight about a race war? And he has us carrying around the weight about this COVID virus? He's got us more worried about that than the salvation of souls. And somebody should have said amen to that. And a sin which so easily besets us, let us run with patience. Boy, that's the one thing I need to pray for. And if I pray for it, that means something bad is going to happen to me to teach me patience. Let us run with patience a race that's set before us, looking under the governor, looking under the president, looking under some other leader. What does it say? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Consider Him that endured such a contradiction of sinners. In other words, they were against Him. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. And it's been so frustrating of people in the ministry and those of you that love the Lord and want to see people saved. We're getting weary. And we are getting tired. But he said, think about what Jesus did on the cross before you get so weary that you give up. Don't ever give up on Jesus Christ. And look how he puts things in perspective for us. You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I've lost blood for all kinds of reasons in my life. But have I ever lost any blood in the battle against sin? No, I haven't. Maybe you haven't either. Maybe way deep down, yes, we've got a lot of opinions, but we have nothing to complain about when it comes to the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He still loves you just as much. No matter those of you that, are, that can hear me right now, if you just destroyed a statue last night or you tore a building down that didn't belong to you, did you know that Jesus Christ loves you so much that He died for you on a cruel Roman cross? If you'll accept Him as your Lord and Savior, He'll give you a peace that you've never had before. And you'll quit destroying things that people have earned and worked for. No matter what color that you are. been a very difficult time, and Brother Jimmy Franks wrote something, and I copied it, and I'm going to read it to you today. If you want to see the heart of ministry today. Because I'll be honest with you, we really don't know what to do other than to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And did you know when it comes right down to it, that's what God's called us to do. Amen. And that's what God's called you to do. Amen. Instead of sitting silent and getting involved in things that have no spiritual value to them, God's called us all to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm asking you, please bring your seeds and put them in a basket. God has a purpose for that. Here's what Brother Jimmy Franks, as pastor of Southland Baptist, said. And I'll close in just a minute. Those of you that are in a hurry to get to McDonald's. The Washington Examiner reported the governor of California has officially banned churches to not allow more than 100 people in attendance. He banned all singing, chanting, and other types of vocal worship. I've led our congregation to cooperate fully in the battle against the spread of the virus. I'll continue to try and lead prudently, prudently, and responsibly. However, it's becoming clear that the battle is not just against the virus. That is what's on my mind today. What's in my heart is to lead in these uncertain times in a way that pleases God. Since I cannot please everyone else, my priority is to please God. Amen. Nothing else really matters. What I desperately need is prayer to discern the way. I'm going to stop right there. For those of you that have grabbed this pastor's hand and prayed for him, I say thank you. When the Spirit leads you to pray for this pastor, he says thank you. He said the way to be a responsible leader, keeping the health and the welfare of everyone in focus, and to take a stand when the time comes against someone overreaching that has a different agenda to, than to defeat the virus. I don't shrug away from this responsibility today, but I will tell you from the bottom of my heart, the greatest nightmare that I have as a pastor, other than a soul being lost and dying and going to a devil's hell, is that something would happen to one of you. It would take one of your lives. And we're trying to still have service. We're still trying to worship despite all the odds that are against us. Please, don't quit. Amen. Please don't give up. Because if one of those folks that lost their life, listen to me real close, has not accepted Jesus Christ, they would have been better off if they were never born. That's what's at stake today as I preach the gospel to you. Yes, I've enjoyed the celebration of our nation and its freedom. There's not going to be peace in any of our hearts until we individually accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Those of you that are in the midst of a battle, Jesus is your answer. Amen. Jesus is your peace. He doesn't care who you are, where you came from. He doesn't even care what your motive is. He wants to change all those things in your life. If you don't know Christ, you come today. The hymn of invitation will be played. If you want to come pray for your nation, pray for another church member, you do so. We need to lift each other up in this nation and not forget the reason that God has built this particular church body and the church all over the world is to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything after that is extra. If you don't know Christ, you come. If you've got a love one that's lost, if you've ever prayed for them, you need to today. Amen. You need to today. Now, I'm not spreading fear today. I'm just telling you the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. If you don't accept Him as Lord and Savior, you'll burn in the devil's hell. And here's how simple it is, and I close. You'll recognize who Jesus Christ is, that He is the Son of God. The Bible says that He rose again the third day. The next words are this. Thou shalt be saved. 
For with your heart you believe unto righteousness. The mouth has made it to, to salvation. It's just that simple. Quit complicating it. Quit making it more difficult than it is. He simply said on the cross, as hell was celebrating, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness has already been offered up. Why don't you accept it today? You come, whatever your need is today, you come.